Hi, everybody. Um, so this is unit four for um, chemistry. And this is probably the first real unit that I like we I feel like it's really chemistry. So I'm I love this chapter and the next couple after it. Hopefully you will feel the same. So we'll see. So we're going to start off with the atomic theory. Remember that all matter is made of atoms and um, We've talked in other classes about the parts of the atom, and actually we've talked about the atomic theory also. But I want to run through it again, talk about some models and those kinds of things, and just kind of refresh your memory on atoms themselves. So starting out, our first, um, our first person is a um, Greek philosopher named Democritus. And in the 4th century BC, he was the um, first person to suggest the idea that there are particles of matter that don't get any smaller. And so he um, named this particle an atomus, which just means it's indivisible. Yeah. And maybe he wasn't even really talking about a particle, but just the, the concept that eventually we're going to get to such a small thing, we can't divide it anymore. And um, of course, this is where we get our word atom today. Now, unfortunately, Democritus, um, his, his theory wasn't originally well accepted and so you don't really um, see a lot happening with atoms and that kind of research partly just because of the times and people didn't really do experiments but also just because he wasn't um, he wasn't believed as much as um, he should have been it turns out anyway so a long long time passes and our first real guy um, in terms of the atomic theory is a man named John Dalton and he was um, working in the early 1800s and he came up with basically four or excuse me five basic components of this theory and applied it to matter and atoms and so the first one is that matter is made up of tiny indivisible particles called atoms basically he took that right from democritus then he said that atoms of the same element are the same so um so basically he was saying, you know, just like I've said, you know, a hundred times, if I have a handful of gold, every atom in there is exactly alike. And then um, he said kind of what I consider kind of a kind of a no brainer, atoms of different elements are different. So if I have gold and silver, I have two different types of atoms. Then um, he said atoms of different elements combine in fixed number ratios to form compounds. So we've talked about substances, remember substances are elements or compounds. That fixed number ratio goes along with the definition that a substance is uniform um, in composition. It's uniform and definite, always has to be the same. And so, you know, this again is one of those examples that I have used a gazillion times with you guys. Water. Water is H2O. And so H2O is water, just like, uh, let's see, H, I may have to do mental math here, H6O3, just like um, H24O12, all of those are water. That's the same ratio. If you change the ratio, it's not water anymore. And then the last one, in reactions, atoms separate, combine, um, rearrange themselves, whatever it is. And so that's how we form or see different forms of substances. Now, I also, we're going to talk about some models. And obviously this one's pretty basic. Um, we have John Dalton's model. And it was basically just like a, a sphere, a solid sphere. And um, so it's indivisible, uniformly dense. Oh, I have an extra S in there. Um, and solid. And so he did not obviously know about any of the subatomic particles at this point. He just um, just based it on the idea that it's indivisible. Can't get any smaller than this. So obviously not to scale, but you know it's basically like you know like um, like a BB. And um, and this model, you know, this was kind of the beginning model. Obviously, it will be improved upon. So our next guy, and it took him almost 100 years, if you notice the dates, um, a man named J.J. Thompson, um, through working with magnets and magnetic fields, realized that there are charges in an atom, that you have something that is positively charged, which we will later talk about as protons, and something that is negatively charged, which are electrons. And um, he set it up so that it was still a solid sphere, 
but you had these positive and negative um, regions. And so on my picture, uh, the red is the positive charge and the blue dots are the electrons and they are embedded into the positive kind of a matrix. And so he called this a plum pudding model because of what it looked like to him. Um, never had plum pudding, so I won't really know. To me, it looks kind of like a chocolate chip cookie. All right. Now, not much longer, we get to kind of like the, the guy, the rock star of the um, atomic models, and that is a man named Ernst Rutherford. And he did even more work, and he did a very famous experiment that we'll talk about in a minute. And he proposed the idea that atoms have a very small, dense center. It is a, um, has a positive charge to it, and he called this the nucleus. Don't confuse this with the nucleus of a cell, different thing, but it is, you know, in the middle. It's in there somewhere, so, you know, you can see why they would do the same. Again, science uses the same words for different things, so just go on. All right, and then he said that the electrons move around the nucleus like bees around a hive. So there's no real pattern to the movement of the electrons, but they do stay close to the nucleus. That closeness or that, that, um, the reason that they are staying close to the nucleus is the positive charge of the protons, again, that we'll talk about in a little bit, is um, attracting the negatively charged electrons. And so they're kind of hovering. They can't come all the way in because if they get too close, all of the negative electrons repel each other. So again, you have kind of that, that push pull kind of a thing going on, like when trying to, when you're trying to put two magnets together. And so, so he, this was it like this is basically what we you know have today in our minds um with a few adjustments but as far as the general setup rutherford was was really good and then he was also um he also proved it through an experiment and this experiment without a doubt is one of the um the biggest discoveries um, scientifically ever. And so he um, did this gold foil experiment, gold foil experiment, excuse me, and he bombarded a thin metal foil and gold was um, what he used as far as the metal with alpha particles. So the reason he used metal is because he could roll it into a very thin layer. You know, like he was trying to get it like one atom thin, like you could see through this foil. It was really, really thin. And then by this time they had discovered um, radioactivity they had discovered um you know like the alpha particles again we'll get to that in a little bit and he knew how to, to kind of direct them so over here you have this alpha emitter so this is the source of the alpha particles and he could aim them and so he was in a room that was obviously you know secure and you know he had like lead around and you didn't want the alpha particles going too far or you know they wanted him to keep them pretty uh, pretty contained and he aimed them at this metal foil. Now on the other side of the foil was a fluorescent screen. So this is very similar to like x-ray film and when it is exposed to light you will see like a little dot. Like you will see where um, where that alpha particle um, strikes the fluorescent screen. So he did this, you know, who knows how many alpha particles he, he shot at it, but just for kind of the ease of doing some math, um, let's say that he shot 100 particles, 100 alpha particles at this foil. Now what he saw was that most of them went straight through, like didn't seem to be, you know, touching anything. So out of our 100 shots, essentially, if most of them went through, then we might say something like 95 of them just went straight through. Now, um, Hang on, I'm struggling with my 95. Okay, there we go. So 95 went straight through. Then a few, the blue arrows that I have, were deflected by a, a pretty small angle. Like you could tell, you know, momentum kind of carried them through, but they came, they something kind of pushed them off course a little bit. And so the few deflected ones, you know, maybe we had four that were deflected by a small angle, but still went through, still hit the screen. And then very occasionally, one didn't make it through like it was basically bounced backwards and so that was our remaining one and so um and like i said he did this way more than 100 times but he always came out with essentially the same 
same percentages, same results. Most went through, a few, a small number were deflected, and you know, like one would come backwards. And so his conclusion was that these atoms contain a very small, dense center, and it has that positive charge. Now, the reason that he came up with the positive charge is because these alpha particles up here, that's this HE, have a positive charge. They knew that. And so think back to what you know about magnets. If you try and put the two positive ends of a magnet together, you can get them close, but then, but then they won't, you know, they won't, they won't hit. You can't, you can force them, but they won't stay close together. And so as an alpha particle came by the nucleus, it would, if it was coming at it, it would just kind of push away from it, push on down, push up, you know, whatever it was. And so that's where he got that positive charge was knowing that the alpha particles were positive. Um, and so most, like, like you, you know, like you said, weren't deflected at all because how, of how small the nucleus was. Um, a few came close and were pushed off angle. Very few of them though, the one hit head on. So here's your nucleus again, or here's your nucleus. Sorry, I can't get my hand in front of the camera. And here comes the alpha particle and hits straight on like right in the center of it. And so it just goes backwards. And so that's what he was basing all of this on. Now I have a link down there to a video where it shows, um, shows someone going through the same experiment. And this experiment has been performed hundreds, maybe thousands of times um, since 1909 or so. And the results, the ratios, the, the data come back the same every time. So Rutherford knew what he was doing. Okay, so now moving on from that, once they figured out some of this stuff about atoms, they started um, organizing things. You know, they were discovering elements. They were figuring out um, numbers and masses and all kinds of things. So they started to develop a system for organizing. And so they started out by giving every element an atomic number. And this is the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. And so, on our periodic table, on the one that we'll get in a few weeks and you guys will have you know, to cherish for the rest of your life, it is set up with a number at the top, um, the top uh, right-hand corner, and that is the atomic number. So that is always the number of protons, and it is the number of electrons if you're talking about a neutral atom. So if the positive and the negative would cancel out, protons, electrons will be the same number. Um, that number is the order of the elements on the periodic table. Okay, so looking at the number, looking at where the periodic, or excuse me, where the element is, tells you the number of protons that you're dealing with. Now, also on the periodic table, and we'll talk more about the the real format, is the mass number. Now, for an individual atom, you have the atomic mass number, and that is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And what you have on the periodic table, the reason that it's a decimal, is because it is a, an average number. And we'll talk more about that. But with elements, or excuse me, with atoms, protons don't change. You can't change the protons and still have the same atom, but neutrons can vary. And so that's where they get these different numbers. Okay, so now isotopes. Isotopes are atoms that have the same number of protons, so they're the same element, but they have different neutrons or different number of neutrons, and so their mass numbers will be different. Um, and so I have that question there, isotopes have the same number of protons, why? Because they are the same element. Okay, they are the same element, always and forever. If protons are the same, you have the same element. Now, I can change the number of neutrons without doing anything because that's not the number of protons. And so these are uh, called isotopes, and isotopes are usually designated in two forms. So that first one, you have the symbol of the element. So again, you should know most of these by now. Um, so this is carbon, of course. The bottom number is always going to be the atomic number. So notice that six, and if you looked on a periodic table, number six is carbon is C, and then you have the mass number, protons plus neutrons. 
So for um, that first isotope where I have C and then I have um, 12 is my mass number, I know that I have six protons. So six plus six is what would equal 12. So I know that I have six neutrons also. Um, and then for the, the second example, notice that the mass number is now 13. So still have six protons, that never changes. But now my number of neutrons, if you just subtract them, I have, oops, excuse me, seven neutrons. Okay, so it's basically just telling you the different, um, how, or at least will help you figure out the different number of neutrons. Also, sometimes they will write them um, the name of the element, so the actual word. And then you don't get any information about the atomic number, about the number of protons, but it does give you the mass number. Okay, so again, if you have a periodic table handy, you can still figure it out. Okay, so here is just, just to make sure everybody's got it, how many neutrons are in these atoms? So for that first one, 18 minus 8 would give us 10 neutrons. The second one, 32 um, a a mass number, and then 16 atomic number. So 32 minus 16 would give us 16 neutrons. And then that last one, 108 is the mass number, 47 is the atomic number. So that would be, um, yikes, mental math. So that would be um, 161 neutrons, okay? So those are, um, those are always set up pretty easy, just basic subtraction to find neutrons or addition if you have the protons and the neutrons. Okay, so now, the average atomic mass is the weighted average of the mass of the isotopes. This is what you see on the periodic table. This is why there are decimals there. And the weighted average depends on the mass of the isotope and the percent abundance. So a percent abundance is the number of each different type of isotope divided by the total number of isotopes times 100 because we're dealing with a percent. Um, and so, in, so here's our little example. So in our sample of element QQ, which is not a real thing, we have four different isotopes. So there, um, so there's four different weights out there. And so if you go out in nature and gather up QQ and you have a certain sample, out of your sample you have 14 atoms that are the, the first type, nine atoms the second, 11 atoms the third, and then two atoms are the fourth type. And then it wants to know what is the percent abundance of each atom and so to do this you would add up each of those you would add those numbers so you would have 14 I'm trying to find the best place to write this 14 plus 9 plus 11 plus 2 and so you would get 36 so there's my total number of atoms if I want to find the percent abundance of each isotope and we'll just do the first one just so you see it you would take 14, so there's my first um, type, divided by 36, whatever that number is, times, times 100. And that would equal the percent abundance of that first type. Do the same thing for the, the nine atoms of the second type. So it would be 9 divided by 36 times 100, 11 divided by 36 times 100, 2 divided by 36 times 100. And those that would give you the percent abundance of each isotope. If you have all of the numbers, an easy way to check it is they should add up to approximately 100, depending on how you round. All right, so there's percent, or excuse me, there, yeah, there's percent abundance. Now, the average atomic mass is where we actually get the decimal. And so the formula for this is to add up, take the sum of the mass times the percent abundance as a decimal for all the isotopes. So the element mustangium has two isotopes. The first one has a mass of 115 grams and a percent abundance of 53. The second has a mass of 128 and a percent abundance of 47. What's the average atomic mass? So you would take your 115 times the abundance as a decimal. So it's 53% abundance, that is 0.53 as a decimal. And then you would get whatever that is. Sorry, I don't have a calculator with me. And then you would have 
times 0.47 equals whatever that is. And then you would get those two answers and you would add them up. The number that you get is going to be somewhere between 121 and 115. It's going to be an average between those two, but it's not the exact average because the the, uh, excuse me, the percent abundances are not equal. And so one of them will be a little more um, in that calculation and the other one will be a little less. Okay. All right, so now the next thing. So we've got isotopes. You have a different mass because you have different numbers of neutrons. Then you have ions. Ions are when you have a group, an atom or a group of atoms that have a positive or a negative charge. These can only be formed with the gain or the loss of electrons. You cannot change the number of protons and still have the same atom. You can only change electrons. All right, so a cation, any atom that has a positive charge. It has fewer electrons than the neutral atom, so it has lost electrons. So sodium, Na, when it is neutral, has 11 protons because it's number 11 on the periodic table and 11 electrons. They cancel each other out. As a cation, sodium has lost one of its electrons, so now it has 11 protons and 10 electrons. And so that little plus one right there, that is because 11 minus 10 equals positive one, equals one. So that's where that comes from. So now I have one, um, one fewer electron, so my positives are greater. All right, an anion has a negative charge, and so an anion has more electrons than a neutral atom, so it has gained an electron. So chlorine has 17 protons, um, because it's number 17 on the periodic table, and 17 electrons when it is neutral. They cancel out. Chlorine is um, a natural anion. It tends to gain one electron, and so the little negative one that you see right there is because 17 minus 18 equals negative 1. Okay, so now factors in a, a magnetic field. So this was another thing that they did to kind of figure out the size, um, the kind of the the mass or um, you know the bulk of an atom and what they found was that lighter or smaller particles were more affected like their path was changed um, to a larger degree than um, a larger atom and so I've got my two atoms are these plus signs with circles around them down here so I'm designating the size just by the size of the circle so clearly one's pretty big and one's kind of small so if you send them through a magnetic field Obviously, they are going to eventually be, through positive and negative attraction, attracted, in this case, towards that neg the negative signs. So this one, the, the bigger atom, will, because of momentum, go, go straight, but will start to kind of curve uh, slightly. The littler one will start out straight, but will curve much more quickly and a little bit more dramatically. Again, to us, not a big deal, but this helped um, help the scientists figure out the mass, figure out the size of some of these elements, and, and figure out how to fit them in like to the periodic table and to the order and whatnot. Okay, then another factor, the, the charge. So the higher number charge is going to be more affected. And so, for example, so I've got two atoms that are the same size, so my circles are the same size here, but one has a negative one charge and one has a negative two charge. So this one, because it has, it is more charged, essentially, is more negative, it will be more affected. So our negative one, again, start out, and it will eventually curve, sorry, my line's not super straight there, um, towards the positive because it's negative. But the negative two, you'll see a much more drastic attraction to that positive side because of the number of negatives. Again, this helped when they were figuring out um, anions or and, uh, excuse me, cations and kind of what their charge was. Okay, I'm going to skip this page. We're going to do this in class, so don't worry about this one. 
All right, so now we're on to nuclear chemistry. This is chapter, I believe, 28 in our textbook. So we're, we're going from like chapter three all the way up to 28. Nuclear chemistry, I just like to talk about it now because we deal a lot with the atoms and, and some of the stuff inside the nucleus with protons and neutrons. And so I just put it in here. All right, so just some terms. Radiation, of course, is um, energy that is given off from a source in our case, the nucleus of an atom, and travels through space. It was discovered by a man named Henry Becquerel, and uh, it was kind of an accident. He was in a lab with some radioactive sources, some rocks that he didn't know were radioactive, and he put them into a drawer, the rocks, with um, a fluorescent screen, and when he checked back on them, however long um, afterwards, the fluorescent screens had been exposed, like he could see white spots. And so he knew there was an energy source. Um, he worked in a lab with several other people. Marie Curie was one of them. And they um, said that this spontaneous emission of radiation was radioactivity. So that's where we have radioactive particles. Um, a nucleid, just, just so you know, I will probably never use this word, but it is a nucleus that is um, is just giving off radiation, is um, is active in that way. Uh, let's see, then we have ionizing radiation. This is energy, or this is um, radiation that has enough energy to, to change atoms and molecules and ions. So this is enough to cause, um, cause these nuclear changes. Um, and then non-ionizing, of course, doesn't have enough energy. So I've got my examples there. We'll talk about alpha, beta, and gamma rays. Um, you guys have probably all had an x-ray. Um, the reason you don't get a whole bunch of x-rays is because it can cause damage. Um, then non-ionizing, you're constantly being um, bombarded with radio waves and microwaves. So you're dealing with it, but again, not causing damage. All right, so now the types of radiation, alpha, beta, gamma. So oh, this little table, it just gives you symbol that um, you will see either as a designation or as part of a um, like a, an equation the charge on the the radiation particle how 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 well it penetrates and then also the size so alpha this is what rutherford used in the gold foil experiment he uh, so he, sorry, helium is the symbol for that because it um, has two protons. It has a mass number of four. So this one is what, this symbol is what you will see most often when we do use it in equations. The little, little alpha down there, it looks like a little A. That's the Greek symbol for alpha. It's positive and it's very big. So you can stop an alpha particle with a piece of paper it is um, just can't get between the spaces so these are not anything to you know really be worried about the sun is giving off some alpha some beta some gamma but not um not enough to really be worried about but anyway so then on to beta you have the e for its symbol like when we use it in a reaction so this e right there and then the b with kind of the long tail again it's the greek letter beta they use the lowercase e because it is similar to an electron. It has a negative charge. It's very, very small. Um, and it is, we can still stop it with some aluminum foil, um, but it is a little bit better at getting through um, substances than beta. These two, by the way, are the ones that um, cause your skin to tan. Um, and so this is where you get tan lines because your clothing can stop. Um, alpha particles obviously for sure and um, and beta beta particles are often stopped all right then gamma this is the one that um, is a little bit more serious you, that the little kind of funny why there is the Greek symbol for gamma it doesn't have a charge which is one of the reasons that it has um, the highest penetration ability it takes several layers of lead or several layers of concrete to stop um, this is why, like, when you go and have a dental x-ray, they put that, that lead apron, like, they lay it across, um, across your body. X-rays and gamma rays are very, very similar. And so they don't want those gamma rays getting into your, into your body, into your soft organs, just on the possibility that there could be damage caused. 
Okay, so now some sources of radiation. Now I have had used the same information for years, so very likely this could have changed a little bit. But this is measured in millirems, and so notice that you know millirems. It takes quite a few of these. The rems are you know the the designation once you get up to the the bigger numbers that could cause damage. But um, this is our possible exposure. So background exposure, things you really can't ignore. Um, come from space, from the sun, from other, um, you know, like other sources of energy, other stars. Um, food, just because it is um, it's grown in the ground, which is can give off radioactive particles. Again, not much to worry about. And then building materials, again, because they are used from, um, from the soil or from ground or rock. Um, other things that you can control or that you can kind of kind of be aware of. Smoking, of course, is is the worst on this list, and I imagine there's some other other chemicals that could go in there, but x-rays, uh, dental x-rays, high altitudes are on there simply because you're up closer to the sun. Um, airplane travel, same thing, up closer to the sun, and so you're closer to one of the sources. Um, we, you know, in general, you don't really need to worry about radiation unless you're deliberately exposing yourself to things. Smoking, of course, don't do it. Um, tanning beds, those kinds of things increase your exposure. Um, and that can be harmful. Um, ionizing radiation can change your DNA. It can upset your cell chemistry, cause different illnesses. It can um, kill cells. It can also um, potentially change their DNA enough that they start to grow in an uncontrolled way, which is cancer. And so um, you don't obviously want to, to have to worry about those kinds of things. It can cause problems with your bone marrow, which could lead to things like leukemia. It could also cause reproductive issues. So again, just be smart in what you're doing. All right, so now some types of decay. This is, um, these are different little equations that I just want you to be aware of. And you will have different, um, different terms, again, that we, I won't really get too into, but I want you to know that the parent nucleid is what you start with, and the daughter nucleid is what you end with. So if something goes through alpha decay, the parent nucleid. So in this first example, that parent nucleid is this thorium, is TH, and it produces an alpha particle. And then, because you can't just destroy matter, you can't get rid of it, you have to have the same amount, you have a daughter that is also formed. And so in this case, that's our little RA. And so that is um, radium. And so one thing to notice about this, this is kind of the problem part, the math part, the numbers add up. The numbers across the top, so 230 is equal to 4 plus 226. So the numbers across the top should uh, equal each other. You can think of the arrow as an equal sign. Same thing with the numbers on the bottom. 90 is equal to 2 plus 88. So getting the this symbol, and we'll do this first one and then we'll move on from here, but this this first example, so uranium as a mass number, or excuse me, an atomic number of 92, so if you're looking or if you have a periodic table, that's um, U is number 92, has a given mass of 238, and if it goes through alpha decay, you have the alpha produced, and then math-wise, so 4 plus 234 equals 238, so there's my top number, and then 2 plus 90 equals 92. Then to get the symbol, I look at the periodic table, I find number 90, just so happens to be TH, and so in this example, TH is our daughter nucleate. All right, so um, check out the examples um, for beta. Okay, so now half-life. Half-life is kind of a controversial um, technique or, or problem that is used. It has been used for a long time to prove that some um, rock samples in the earth are, are very, very old. Um, I'm going over it with you guys simply so that you know the process. Um, it doesn't mean that I think it is always accurate because there's lots of um, assumptions that go on with some of the calculations, but it is it is a good um, 
a good math problem really just to kind of know about. So half-life is the time that it takes for one half of the atoms in a radioactive particle or a substance to decay to its product. So basically to go through alpha decay or beta decay. Um, and so the formula is to start with the sample amount and you multiply it by one half to a power. And we'll go through an example of this in just a minute and you will get the amount remaining after you go through that math. The little n is the number of half-lives. So total time divided by half-life time. All right, so a couple of examples here. We'll do the first one. So fluorine has a half-life of five seconds. Every five seconds, it is dividing in half, essentially. If you begin with 100 grams of fluorine, how many grams remain after one minute? So you start with your 100 grams, so there's my sample amount, times one half. Now I have to raise that one half to a power. So how? So the question is how many half lives, if they're each five seconds, can take place in one minute? And so you have to do a little math here, but one minute is equal to 60 seconds. And then we said that the half life is five seconds. Oops seconds. So 60 divided by 5 gives me gives me 12. So, and I'm not again not going to work it out, but if you punch in your calculator, raise one half to the 12th power, multiply it by 100, and you're going to get a very small amount. Like it just keeps dividing in half, you know, so down to 50, 25, 12 and a half, 6.25, you know, it just keeps getting smaller and smaller. And so that is half-life. All right, so look at that second one, see if you can do it, and we'll talk about it in class. All right, so now, there's some good stuff about radioactivity. It can be a really nice power source. Um, something that we have been able to do for a while is fission, and fission is a reaction where the nucleus is broken into two or more smaller nuclei. Um, this releases an enormous amount of energy. Uh, it's the basis, of course, for the atomic bombs. And, of course, the energy that was released there destroyed cities. Um, and so it is, it is ama an amazing source of energy. And so just the energy that's holding a nucleus together is almost more than we can fathom. Um, we have nuclear power plants that use fission um, of uranium and um, plutonium and some other things to produce energy. Um, the downside to fission is that the the um, the waste products, the the fuel rods that they use and um, that contain the reactions, they are extremely radioactive after use, and so we still have this fairly dangerous substance, and that's kind of the problem is how to get rid of it. Now the other um, reaction that you see or that we um, are aware of and that we're working on is fusion, and this is when you combine two nuclei together to form one bigger nuclei, again releases an enormous amount of energy and um, even more than fission, and it, it does not produce any radioactive waste. The problem is, is right now we just, it's so, so much power that we just really have trouble containing it. We're working on it and there's lots of progress and there's cold fusion and other different things. Um, but it's still not um, not viable, really, as an energy source. It just costs too much to do it. Um, but it is, as far as we are concerned, a, a major source of energy because that's what the sun is doing. Okay, so some things just to be aware of. Um, and again, I, I've covered these for years, so this may be a little outdated. But um, getting rid of the nuclear waste is the real problem. And so there are several ways that they have worked to do this. Uh, one is bury it. That causes problems because the containers will leak over time. Um, and so you'll see see underground sources or, or um, where the radioactive um, the radioactive material has leaked into groundwater and you know it contaminated things. So it's kind of rough to do. Um, reprocessing the fuel rods is um, is another option. Again, very expensive and you're still dealing with very dangerous um, substances, so kind of a problem. Um, they do oftentimes melt it into glass, mix it with sand and melt it down into glass and then bury it. This melting it into glass is called vitrification. 
a little better than just burying it because it's not as prone to leak, but it still will seep out into the surrounding soil. So kind of bad idea. Now we've done even worse though, sadly. Um, originally before we had, you know, the EPA and different, um, you know, watchdog groups on these kinds of things, people like dumped it in the ocean, um, you know, and so when fish started having like seven eyes, they got kind of freaked out and stopped doing that. Um, there was the idea to burn it, um, which is a problem because it puts it into a gas form and then here we are breathing it in. Uh, and then the last one sent it into outer space. This was actually a pretty, um, a pretty supported idea until we had the explosion of several of our space shuttles. And then again, so then it would be in the atmosphere. So they don't do that. Okay, so now transmutation. This is um, basically changing the, the atom that is, uh, you know, it's emitting alpha particles or beta particles or gamma particles. And it is doing that because it's unstable and it's trying to get to a stable energy level. Um, the cause for the instability is usually the proton to neutron ratio. And so usually a one to one ratio is very stable. So if I have six protons, six neutrons, keeps it pretty stable or, you know, somewhere close to that. Um, and so that's what it's trying to do is get rid of the extra neutrons, get rid of some of those particles and, and become stable. So when this decay happens, when you get um, go from unstable to stable, that is when transmutation has occurred. Okay, so for some elements, it is a natural process. Some are naturally radioactive and we um, can induce it in certain elements to produce new elements. Um, on the periodic table, we have, you know, I've talked to you about how some of them have like, or look different, like it's just the outline of the letters. And um, those elements are all products, man-made products of transmutation. We have forced, um, forced transmutation to happen. All right, so that forced transmutation takes place in particle accelerators. It happens when you take the nucleus of an atom and you hit it with an alpha particle or another neutron and they stick together. Um, that new element is unstable. It's not the way it's supposed to be and so it will go through decay pretty quickly. But that's how they make an element. And um, so it has so far not produced a lot of elements that are very usable because they're so unstable, but it is, um, it is a process that people have worked on for years and years. Um, so I'm going to skip this equation, look at it, and see if you can figure it out, and we'll go over it in class. All right, now some uses of radiation. On our test, I will ask you to match or to, to list some of these uses, so you might want to be looking over these. Um, so tracers, this is a big one. The, you can use these radioactive isotopes to, to track a, an element through a chemical reaction or track a substance through like a pipeline or you know an area that you can't see. And so you can basically tag an element with a, something radioactive. And so then you can then you can trace it. And so because it's noticeable it's giving off energy. Um, so oil and pipeline is um, can be traced, groundwater um, can be traced to see where it is flowing, an element through a reaction, like I said, uh, medically, this is very common um, to determine the location of different tumors or even x-ray different organs. Um, some of your soft organs will take in very specific elements because it's part of their, their cell processes. And so if we give a radioactive form of, of those specific elements, then it will basically like highlight the, um, the gland or the organ that you're looking at. So um, I've listed some of them there look over them again we will we'll talk about them and you'll need to know some of them so kind of start looking over and committing to memory um, medical treatment of course radiation can be used in cancer treatments um, it does kill cells which is good the the downside of using it is that it will also kill healthy cells and so that's a technique they're really working on power source like we said um, fission, which is what we still do quite a bit of, it uses uranium or plutonium. Fusion, which is the sun, is um, hydrogen, do different isotopes of hydrogen. 
in the in industry it radiation is used to to preserve foods to sterilize equipments um, for food cobalt is one that is very commonly used again that's the source of background radiation for you um, research so this is the half-life stuff so it can be used to determine the age of fossils carbon is really common in living organism or carbon 14 excuse me is really common in living organisms or organic excuse me organic materials so finding the half-life there um, theoretically can help figure out the age uranium again is found in rocks all right and then the last one radon and this is not really a problem here but I did want to mention it um, there are parts in, of our country where people have radon detectors in their homes, particularly if they have basements. Um, this is because radon is a naturally occurring um, radioactive element, and it is the byproduct of uranium, which is a naturally occurring radioactive element. And radon is a gas. So when uranium breaks down and produces radon, this radon, it can seep out of rock, can seep out of walls, pipes, floors, all kinds of things. Um, again, found mostly in basements and people breathe it in, it gets into their lungs. Um, radon then is also not stable, so it decays into polonium. And polonium and radon are two, um, two known causes of lung cancer. And so um, in places where they have certain um, bedrocks or ground rock, and have basements, they will have radon detectors for this very reason. There are ways to seal basement walls and to seal different um, structures so that the radon can't get through, but these detectors are used to make sure that the levels aren't dangerous. All right, so there is unit four. Whew, that's a long one. So um, as always, be sure and ask me questions. Be sure and um, get through the equate or the examples in there and um, and we'll go over everything in class. Thanks guys.